This is a lecture on Leviticus chapters 16 through 27. It covers the Day of Atonement and the Holiness Code. And my name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle. The Day of Atonement is to this day the most sacred day in Judaism. It occurs on the 10th of Tishri, which would be September, October in our calendars. Only once a year, and even then, only the high priest could at that time enter the Holy of Holies, the most holy place where the presence of God was, in the middle of the tabernacle to offer this Day of Atonement sacrifice. There were several steps in the ritual. First of all, the high priest must make atonement for himself. Before entering the presence of God, the high priest had to offer a bull as a sin or purification offering uh, for himself uh, so as to be sufficiently clean to conduct the ritual. The text recalls how Aaron's two sons died for approaching God too casually uh, back in Leviticus chapter 10. The ritual involves two goats offered for Israel. After the priest offered the bull for himself, he presents two goats for Israel. The one was chosen by Lot to get sacrifice as a sin or purification offering. The other, traditionally rendered the scapegoat, gets driven into the desert, symbolically bearing away the sins of the people. There are two goats, as we said. The second goat has been traditionally called the scapegoat, although this translation is disputed. The English term means the escape goat. That is, it's the goat that gets away. It's the one that goes into the desert and escapes alive. So, thus the translation uh, escape goat. It uh, understands the underlying Hebrew uh, azazel, uh, as a compound word, az, goat, and azel, go, it's the goat that goes. It's the goat that goes away, uh, hence the scapegoat. And this view is as old as the Greek Septuagint's translation, uh, the LXX, which dates to the 2nd century B.C. The alternative interpretation is that Azazel is the name of a demon, perhaps a goat demon. Uh, this is the view uh, offered in the English Standard Version and the New Revised Standard Version. If this view is true, it would explain the parallel formulation, uh, one goat for the Lord and one for Azazel, which is literally what the text says. Sending the goat to Azazel may mean that was sending it to the place associated with Azazel, namely the hideous desert. In any case, there is no goat demon known by that name from the ancient Near East, and I believe this makes the traditional view a little bit more likely. The Day of Atonement ritual was to deal with the problem of sin and ceremonial uncleanness, uh, which was incompatible with a holy God dwelling among a sinful people. It says in verse 15, he is then to uh, slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. The bull was for the priest himself. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover in front of it. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place, because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been, he is to do the same for the tent of the meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And then in verse 20, when Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of the meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat, he is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sin, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert, 
in the care of the man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins into a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. Now, Walter Kaiser, in his book Towards an Old Testament Theology, has put it this way, that the two goats represent two interrelated things. The first goat represents sin forgiven. The first goat was sacrificed to make atonement for the sins and uncleannesses of Israel. Blood sacrifice was the means for forgiveness of sin. And thus, the first goat represents sin atoned for and sin forgiven. The second goat, on the other hand, represents sin forgotten, the scapegoat. They symbolically put on the head of the goat all the sins and uncleanness of the people and drove it out into the desert, representing sin removed and forgotten by God. Now, all of these things foreshadow the sacrifice of Christ. The New Testament, especially Hebrews uh, chapter 7 and chapters 9 and 10, see the Day of Atonement as a type of the, t- the atoning work of Christ on the cross. Though Christ's work is superior, Christ is a better priest, unlike Aaron, Christ as priest was sinless. He didn't need to offer sacrifice for himself, uh, Hebrews 7 verses 26 and 27. The sacrifice of Christ has a longer effect. Christ's sacrifice needed only to be offered up once, not annually like the Day of Atonement sacrifice, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. And it was also offered in a better sanctuary. Unlike Aaron, who enters the earthly sanctuary, Christ enters heaven itself to do his priestly work, Hebrews 9 and verse 24. Let's move on to the Holiness Code. Leviticus chapter 17 through 27 is often called the Holiness Code because of its emphasis on the theme of holiness. And let's touch on some of the details of that section of the book. In Leviticus chapter 17, it talks about holy food or holy meat and also dealing with blood. This chapter demands that Israelites in the wilderness not eat the blood, verse 10. That is, not eat meat of any clean or holy animal without first offering it on the Lord's altar. And special care had to be taken with the blood because of the theology of the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. That's Leviticus 17 and verse 11. And this implies a close connection between atonement and the shedding of blood. That's uh, picked up in the book of Hebrews chapter uh, 9 and verse 22, where it talks about how uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Sin is so serious a thing that only with the death of a substitute can it be forgiven. And again, this foreshadows and anticipates the death of Christ. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verses 13, 14, and also verse 26. Some chapters in Leviticus, especially chapters 18, 19, and 20, uh, emphasize practical holiness, sexual, and other forms of purity. For example, in chapters 18 and chapters 20, it condemns various forms of incest. In chapter 18 and verse 21, it condemns human sacrifice. In chapter 18 and verse 22, it condemns homosexual acts. In chapter 19, it reaffirms the principles of the Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments. It talks about honoring your parents. It condemns idolatry. 
talks about sacrifice, talk about leaving gleanings in the field for the poor, talks about theft and false witness and swearing falsely as being sins, uh, it talks about paying wages in a timely way to people that work for you. It talks about perversions of justice. It has a famous verse about loving one's neighbor as oneself. It uh, maintains symbols of holiness and talks about sexual immorality with a slave girl, divination, and the like. A lot of laws uh, that reemphasize the kind of concepts found in the Ten Commandments. Leviticus 19.18 is said by Christ to be the second greatest commandment in the law. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Jesus lists with loving God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, uh, which is Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this verse, to love your neighbor as yourself, is the greatest commandments. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Now, there were special holiness requirements for priests. And this is described in Leviticus chapters 20 and 21. For example, they could not marry non-virgins. Uh, interestingly, prophets could. Hosea married a non-virgin, but uh, priests uh, could not. Priests could not bury dead people that would uh, make them ceremonially unclean and unfit for their priestly duties, so they couldn't even uh, bury their own uh, parents. They could not be disfigured or have any skin disease. This was parallel with the demand that animals devoted to the Lord also had to be unblemished. And you might compare the story of the Good Samaritan here that explains the Good Samaritan not wanting to stop and help someone who looks like he might have been killed along the road because if he would have stopped and helped the man, uh, he would have been ceremonially unclean and he was on his way to Jerusalem to do his priestly service. It was at least understandable that he would do that, although the point of Jesus' story is that he should have, even if at the sacrifice of his ability to do his priestly duty, he should have showed love to the Samaritan. Leviticus chapter 24 talks about the holy place and the holy name. It talks about the tabernacle requiring pure oil and flour in verses 1 through 9. It talks about cursing Yahweh and how that would be punished severely in verses 10 through 16 and verse 23. It repeats the lex talionis principle, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and so forth, a uh, principle uh, for wrongs done. It's a principle of justice that uh, punishment should fit the crime. Punishment for an eye for an eye damage, the punishment of a tooth for a tooth knocked out. It wasn't meant for personal revenge, but it was a principle of justice in the courts. And then chapters 23 and 25 talk about the holy days and holy times, special days in Israel's calendar. And here's a list of the uh, holy days. Uh, you have the Sam Sabbath principal holidays. You have the Sabbath day and the Sabbath month and the Sabbath year and the year of Jubilee. And you can see the verses in Leviticus that talk about these things. And then there's other holy days, the Passover, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Booze, the Day of Atonement, the New Moon, and Purim uh, are other holy days, biblical holy days. Not all of them are in Leviticus. And then there's post-Old Testament holy days, uh, Hanukkah, the Ninth of Ab, and Joy of Torah. And so let's talk about each one of these a little bit. Once a week, you had the Sabbath day. That was a special day where they were not to do any work. 23, Leviticus 23 and verse 3 mentions that one. But then the seventh month of the year, Tishri, was also a special month. On the month of Tishri, uh, there were two, uh, actually three major holidays. You had the first day of the month was the Jewish New Year. Later came to be called Rosh Hashanah. They would basically blow the horn for that month, but because it was the seventh month, it was a special blowing of the horn. 
And then also in that month, you have the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And you also have the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles in that month. So the seventh month was a special month in Israel's calendar. And then you have the Sabbath year, described in Leviticus 25, uh, 2 through 7, and again in 26, 32 through 35. Every seventh year, the land was allowed to lie fallow, and the poor were allowed to reap what came up of itself. Deuteronomy 15, uh, verses uh, 1 through 3, implies that this was a temporary release from debt that occurred at the same time. That is, during the Sabbath year, when people were not allowed to cultivate the land as they normally would, then they also didn't have to pay debts on that year. They could just waive that until the next year. I might mention that uh, a lot of the grain uh, harvest would, a lot of it would come up naturally, even if you didn't sow the land. And then in Leviticus 25, you have Sabbath principle festivals. Specifically, uh, the first one is the year of Jubilee, Leviticus 25, verses 8 through 22. Now, this uh, is a Sabbath principle festival because it occurs every seven times seven years. That is, every 49 years. And in this time, slaves were to be released and all the land was supposed to return to its original owners. And so what would happen would be is that uh, during these 49 years, people would buy and sell, and some would borrow and get in economic trouble and have to sell some of their land. And uh, at the end of 49 years, you know, there'd be winners and there'd be losers. But every 49 years, lands would go back to the original families. And so it was a once-of-lifetime thing. The goal of it was to avoid extremes of wealth and poverty. They didn't want some people to be extremely rich and some people to be extremely poor. It's kind of like a Monopoly game where, you know, every 49 years you start the game over again, as it were. Now, it's not clear that this was ever enacted, but that's, that was the principle behind it. Uh, in practice, well, they couldn't do this until they conquered the land. It took them a long time to conquer the land. They got bogged down during the time of the judges. And by the time they did conquer all the land, again, it's not clear that this law actually ever was enacted. But it uh, should have been. A similar custom to uh, what we see in the year of Jubilee was found in the ancient Near East, we have an edict of a Babylonian king uh, called Amisaduka, and the edict of Amisaduka declared release from debts and uh, uh, the like, uh, similar to what happened on the Sabbath uh, year and the year of Jubilee. Again, the purpose was so that poverty wouldn't become permanent in Israel, and once a lifetime, everything starts over again and puts everyone on an even plane. Now, there were three festivals that are known as the Pilgrim Feasts. Deuteronomy 16 and 16 refers to this, that three times a year you were to make a pilgrimage to a tabernacle to worship the Lord. And the first of these Pilgrim Feasts is the Feast of Passover, and associated with the Feast of Passover is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And Leviticus 23, 4 through 14 describe that. Uh, this takes place on the 14th of Nisan, which is March-April in our calendar. It would take place around Easter time in our calendar. The Festival of Unleavened Bread followed for seven days, where they would not eat anything made with leaven. And this was a festival that uh, remembered the plague on the firstborn. Uh, in the plague of the firstborn, they ate bread that was unleavened because they didn't have time for the bread to rise. And so the symbolism here relates to the Exodus story. And we also saw when we talked about that in the book of Exodus, that it relates to the Lord's Supper. The New Testament's Lord's Supper was originally a Passover celebration, and it followed later Jewish custom in that celebration. Now, the Passover included an offering of first fruits, 
uh, in conjunction with Passover was an offering of first fruits of the barley harvest uh, mentioned in Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. This dates to the day after the Sabbath, taken traditionally by Jews as the day after Passover itself, though it may be the day after the Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There's some debate as to the interpretation of that. Then you uh, have the Feast of Weeks is another of the uh, three pilgrim festivals mentioned in Deuteronomy 16, 16, Leviticus 23, 15 through 21. Uh, it's also called Pentecost because it took place 50 days after Passover. So the day of Pentecost in the New Testament was this Feast of Weeks. Uh, it was a harvest festival, and for that reason, it's also called the Feast of the Harvest. And it's also called the Day of the First Fruits because they would offer the uh, first fruits of the early wheat harvest on that day. And then the third and final of the three pilgrim feasts is the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, uh, described in Leviticus 23, 33 through 43. It occurred in the seventh month of the year, that uh, special month, uh, on the 15th through 22nd of the month of Tishri, that's September, October in our calendars. Uh, it has a harvest aspect. It was the end of the harvest season, so it's kind of like a fall, fall wine festival and harvest festival. Again, uh, that's mentioned in Leviticus 23 and verse 39. And then it also has a historical aspect. Uh, it was a remembrance of the wilderness wanderings. Now, in addition to these festivals, there's some minor festivals uh, there was a new moon festival where they blew the trumpet at the first day of every month. Uh, on the seventh month, uh, which uh, later became Rosh Hashanah, there was a special blowing of the horn because it was the Sabbath month. There is a feast of Purim. Uh, that doesn't come along until the book of Esther, chapter 9, verse 24 through 28, celebrates Esther saving her people from genocide. It's not a major festival in Jewish tradition because it was not in the Torah, but it's nonetheless one that's uh, important. And other uh, post-Old Testament uh, Jewish festivals include Hanukkah that uh, deal with the events of 1 Maccabees uh, chapter 4. That was when Judas Maccabeus saved the Jewish people from the attempt of Antiochus IV to try to abolish the Jewish religion. Anyway, Hanukkah is mentioned in John chapter 10, verse 22. And then there's also a festival called the Ninth of Ab. It commemorates the destruction of the temple, originally Solomon's temple, but then later on Herod's temple. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, possibly refers to this festival. Well, the last little bit of Leviticus talks about uh, blessings and cursings in Leviticus chapter 26 that there'd be blessings on Israel if they obeyed God, but disobedience would bring a curse. And the passage implies that they're going to disobey, but God in his grace is going to restore them nonetheless. And then the last chapter, uh, chapter 27, deals with uh, vows and tithes. It talks about uh, the price of redemption of persons and things that have been vowed to the Lord. You can vow someone to the Lord and then decide, well, I don't want my slave to be uh, just given to the temple. And so you could pay money instead to keep the person from actually being given to the sanctuary. And in terms of these kinds of, of vows, uh, it's interesting that Paul himself took a Nazarite vow in uh, Acts 18 and verse 18. Well, that covers the content of Leviticus. Uh, let's talk about Leviticus and the Christian. Does this strange book have any relevance for us today? What theological lessons can we learn? Well, one of the things we can learn from this book is the theme of holiness. Holiness is a key theme of the book. You might say this is a book about holiness. God is holy and cannot tolerate sin and uncleanness. And there is a need for holiness today. The way we express holiness of God may be different than the way that the Israelites did, but the need for holiness is the same. You have the line in Leviticus, uh, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy, is 
uh, chapter 19 and verse 2, that's actually quoted by Peter in 1 Peter and applied to Christians. Then there's the need to live a life of purity. The laws of purity associate impurity with death and purity with life. And one of the purposes was to promote life and to encourage avoidance of that which is associated with death. And another purpose is that it showed the people that by nature they are impure in contrast with God's absolute purity and holiness. And so from the laws of purity, we can learn these types of lessons. And then there's the lesson of worship and communion. Despite his holiness, God wanted to have fellowship or communion with his people. And that's why he had fellowship or peace offerings to cultivate a deeper relationship with him. The festivals were meant to cultivate a deeper relationship with him. And worship could be both an active thing in the Old Testament, giving gifts to God and offerings to God. It wasn't just a passive, you know, sitting in an audience and listening to things. And we can learn that from our worship, that it should be an active thing and not a passive thing. And then we learn about the grace of God. The whole sacrificial system in Leviticus uh, chapters 1 through 7 was a system where God graciously allowed undeserving sinners to be forgiven through blood atonement. It also shows mercy after the exile. In Leviticus 26, the blessings and cursings passage, it indicated that they would disobey and the curse would come upon them. But God promised to receive Israel back after the exile, for, uh, after the, the violation of the covenant. And this shows God's mercy. You see, God relates to people on the basis of mercy and grace he did that even with ancient Israel during the time of the law. And then you have lessons about the priesthood. Spiritual leadership lessons are that, well, the priests were chosen by God. Leviticus chapters 8 and 9, they had to maintain holiness. Leviticus 21 and 22, that failure to maintain holiness could be deadly. The story of Nadab and Abihu, who were killed for offering strange fire before the Lord in Leviticus chapter 10. And uh, they were also subject to sin and defilement like anyone else. So before they could do their priestly duties, they had to purify themselves. And I think all of these uh, have at least analogies with spiritual leadership today, that uh, spiritual leaders are chosen by God, that they're to be holy, and that they're to maintain purity themselves and uh, keep a close uh, relationship with God, confessing our sins as they come up. And then there's lessons about morality. For example, the laws about incest are picked up by Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, where Paul condemns a man sleeping with his father's wife. Well, why did Paul condemn a man for doing that? What made him think that that was wrong? Well, I think he probably had in mind Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 9. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. And then you have that great commandment that's quoted a number of times in the New Testament. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19 and verse 18 obviously applies under the New Covenant, as both Jesus and Paul refers to it. And there's many other areas of morality that uh, we could draw lessons from in Leviticus. It's concern for the poor and the sojourner and the slave and children and social justice and the need for honesty and sexual purity, the integrity of God's, uh, uh, the leaders of God's people and keeping one's promises uh, many areas of morality, all of which still have application today. And then there's the typology of Christ. Hebrews sees in the tabernacle and the priests and the sacrifices of Leviticus a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. The sacrificial system of Leviticus uh, 
provides the conceptual framework for understanding the meaning of the death of Jesus Christ for our sins. And so understood typologically, we look at the sacrifices in Leviticus and we see Christ. And then there are ceremonial laws, which uh, give us a lesson in contrast. On the one hand, the purity laws were abolished in Christ. As uh, Mark 7, 19 says, uh, Christ declared all foods clean. So the clean and unclean food laws are abolished in Christ. And not just the food laws, but other aspects of the clean and unclean laws are abolished. The purity system had at least partially the function of separating Jew from Gentile, and the abolition of these clean and unclean laws also symbolizes something. It symbolizes the breakdown of the barrier between Jew and Gentile in Christ. You have that with Peter, who, when he went to see Cornelius, was given a dream and he was told to eat some unclean things. And he said, I can't do that because, uh, you know, I've never eaten anything unclean in my life. Uh, but God said, do not call anything unclean what God has made clean, Acts uh, 10, 14. And it relates to the Gentiles, like Cornelius, that he would meet, uh, that God was declaring in Christ to be un no longer unclean, but to become a part of the family of God and clean. And it goes back to uh, that in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. This abolishing of the ceremonial uncleanness laws uh, symbolizes the breakdown of that barrier between Jew and Gentile. Anyway, that completes our discussion of the book of Leviticus.